Hello everybody, Pilot H with yet another video. In this video we'll be going through how to start up and set up the 737 from a cold and dark state. Before I start I would just like to point out that setting up the airplane and making it ready for flight is something which will require good use of airmanship. You cannot stress or rush through any steps and you have to exercise strict adherence to checklists and procedures. Starting up the 737 or starting up any airplane uh, is associated with a lot of threats, uh, specifically misconfiguration of the airplane and the airplane systems, or maybe not doing all the required checks. This could come back and bite you later uh, during the flight. But without further ado, how would a real 737 pilot start up the airplane? Well, the first thing I would do in the mornings uh, in my airline, we would find the airplane in a cold and dark state. The first thing I would do is check the uh, aircraft's maintenance status. Behind the captain's seat right here, um, housed just in front of the jump seat, there would be a, a tech log. Inside of the tech log, you will find any uh, relevant uh, hills or hold item list this could be defects uh, perhaps your apu is not functioning and then you need to figure out how that would affect your flight for the day you would also find the notice to air crew uh, which would be some information telling the pilots uh, of any discrepancies or informations they should know about this specific airplane compared to some other airplanes in the fleet you would also check the ship's library and make sure that you're carrying all the manuals you need. And uh, most of them will be housed just beneath this jump seat right here. Here you can see a uh, yeah, picture of the 737 uh, flight manual. Once we have checked uh, all the manuals and paperwork, we can now go ahead and uh, start up the airplane. The first thing we're going to be doing is to uh, turn on the uh, battery switch. The battery switch will be found on the uh, electrical panel right here and it is the black guarded switch. If you move down the guard, the, it is guarded to the on position. This will turn on the battery and the airplane now has DC power. After that, we're going to make sure that our landing gear lever is down and we're going to be looking for three green lights. We all know of uh, these three green lights. They mean that the landing gear is down and locked. But uh, some people may or may not know that up here on the uh, overhead panel, we actually have three more lights. These work as a redundant system to the primary ones. If you have three lights on any of these, you can consider the gear down and locked. But before the start of the flight, we're going to make sure that we have all six. After that, we can go ahead and uh, turn on our electric hydraulic pumps and uh, make sure that the uh, ground power uh, is available to us. Uh, if not, we may have to start our APU at this stage. As you can see, we do have ground power, so we can go ahead and hook up the ground power to the airplane. The airplane is now powered by the DC and the AC uh, power sources, meaning the airplane is fully powered up now and you can start any relevant system. Once all the power is provided to the airplane, you can actually go ahead and do the fire tests. This is the fire panel, and it is here you will start doing the fire test. The first thing we're going to do is to check the fault in op system. You're going to move this towards the left. This is the fault in op, and you're going to make sure that you have a master caution, overheat detection. So we'll do that again just to demonstrate. If you move it to the left, And if we look up here, you can see that the master caution light is illuminated together with the overheat detection light. We're then going to have a look at our fire panel and make sure that we have the fault and the APU detection in op lights. If any of these two lights fail to illuminate, it means that there is a fault in the fault protection circuit. If the uh, APU detection in op circuit does not illuminate here, uh, do not uh, power up the APU, for example. After that, we're going to do the fire and overheat uh, warning test. Before you do that, you could advise the uh, ground personnel that you're going to be doing the test because there will be a, a fire warning uh, in the uh, main wheel well as well. 
uh, warning ground crew that there is a fire. Uh, so once we've done that, we're going to move this towards the right. We're going to make sure that all three fire handles are illuminated, together with the wheel well warning. We can now silence the warning by pressing the fire bell cutout switch either uh, on either sides or the uh, bell cutout switch which is placed on the uh, fire panel. As you note right here the wheel well fire warning is illuminated. This indicates that there is a uh, overheat condition in the wheel well. This will only illuminate if you have AC powered uh, an AC powered airplane. If the wheel well uh, fire does not illuminate, this would mean that there's a fault with the wheel well detection system. After this, we're going to be having a look at the extinguisher circuits. We're going to move them to the left and to the right and make sure that all three green lights illuminate each time. Uh, the left and the right light here is for the engines and the bottom one is for the APU. First now we can start the APU if we desire because now we are confident that if there is a APU fire the APU uh, fire warning would go on. That being said in real airline operations we'll try to delay the APU start for as long as possible just to be able to save some fuel also, this will reduce uh, noise and pollution as well. But uh, as this is a flight simulator, we can go ahead and start the APU now. As we are up here already, we're going to be going ahead and turning on the emergency exit lights. The emergency exit lights will uh, be guarded to the arm position but you could manually turn them on by moving the switch to the on position. To move it to the on, you need to lift up the guard and physically move the switch itself to the on position. But it is guarded to the arm position. Whilst you're here, make sure the attend button works. There shall be a shine in the cabin and a light will also illuminate on the uh, cabin stations. Now, we can go ahead and fall down here and have a look at our flap position and our flap indicator. They should be in agreement. Uh, if they're not, there is a fault with the uh, flaps uh, as the airplane is fully powered up and the ELEC pumps are now working. We're going to then be moving our throttles forward. Uh, this is to check that the takeoff configuration warning system works and you do so by moving the throttles forward and you can see that you will have a uh, takeoff config warning. In some airplanes you will also have a takeoff config light uh, which will illuminate on uh, both sides of the uh, forward panel here. And uh, after that we can go ahead and do our cargo test, cargo fire warning test. Uh, you're going to make sure that the discharge light illuminates both fire warnings and also the green lights here for the extinguisher. Uh, we're going to continue down and there is a uh, microphone here normally in my airline. This is hot wired to the PA system. We're going to be checking the operation of the PA microphone right now as well. Also down here you will find the gear pins. Uh, which you need to uh, obviously count, make sure there's three of them. If not, you need to verify the position of the missing one, make sure that it's not in the, uh, in the gear, uh, as this will prevent that gear from being uh, raised after departure. Uh, after that, we can actually start our uh, pre-flight, and this is what we call a rainbow scan, because we're going to move up and down here, uh, almost as a rainbow. So the rainbow scan starts off from at the bottom here and uh, we're going to be checking all the circuit breakers. Uh, this panel here is the P6 panel and then we're going to be checking the escape rope. We can actually open up this hatch and make sure that not only that the escape rope is there but that it's actually attached to the fuselage. We're going to be moving up and uh, turning on our voice recorder. 
the voice recorder is uh, placed here. There sh uh, is a on, uh, an, a on and auto button. I'm going to move that to the on position. This will start the voice uh, recorder. Uh, after that, we can go ahead and check our flight recorder. We will lift this guarded switch and move to the test position. The off light should extinguish. This means that the flight data recorder is uh, operating correctly. Now, do not confuse this switch with this switch. It has happened in the 737 in real airlines that the uh, pilots will confuse the two switches and uh, as they try to do the flight recorder test, they will deploy the passenger oxygen mask. Moving this switch from normal to on will deploy every single oxygen mask in the cabin and you're gonna have a very bad day. Uh, after that, we are going to do our Mac uh, airspeed warning test. You will press 1 and number 2 independently and verify that you will have the clacker. Uh, after that, we're going to be doing the stall warning test, number 1 and number 2. Now, the stall warning test is a little bit unique in that the fact that it needs uh, approximately 3 to 4 minutes uh, with the AC transfer buses powered before the stall warning functions uh, normally. So if it fails uh, straight after startup, you might have to just wait a little bit, make sure that the airplane is uh, on AC power for about three to four minutes and then redo the test. Um, you're just gonna continue down towards our left here. And the next thing we're gonna be checking is our engine panel here and make sure that the reverse lights are extinguished, that our EECs are in the uh, normal mode uh, meaning on position. Uh, there is a uh, alternate mode which is just black uh, but we're gonna make sure that they, it is in the on position. There could also be a alt light here. Uh, after that we're gonna be checking our passenger oxygen uh, switch here. Make sure that it's normal. Do not touch it but make sure that the passenger oxygen on light is extinguished and we're gonna move to our left. Make sure that the crew oxygen is uh, sufficient for flight. Uh, normally we're looking at a figure of above uh, 1100 PSI for our first flight. Uh, as you can see here now it's uh, above 1500 so we're good to go. As we move to our left the next uh, switch we're going to be uh, paying attention to is our service interphone switch. This switch will enable all the external service interphone jacks to be connected into the service interphone system. Moving the switch to off, all the service interphone switches will be disabled and they cannot communicate with the airplane. This excludes the cabin crew uh, service interphone system as they will always be active regardless of switch position. So place it as you desire uh, for the day's operation. Moving left, we are now looking at the GPS light Make sure that this is extinguished. Move down and turn your uh, RSMO selectors to nav. As we do so, we're gonna verify that both on DC lights illuminate. They should be illuminated momentarily, followed by a steady illumination of the line light, and then they should uh, remain illuminated until the IRS is ready to receive a position, and then they will be flashing. So we're gonna go ahead and move these to on nav position. You can observe the on DC. We got the steady align light, and once they're ready to receive a RS position, they will start flashing. Uh, as they work away, we're going to be checking the PSEU light. Uh, it's very important this light is extinguished. It is a non-dispatchable fault, uh, so we have to make sure that the cause of the uh, illumination is uh, found and that the light is uh, reset before you take off. Now we're going to come down here and we're going to be checking the captain's escape uh, rope. Again, do not just check that the escape rope is in there, but uh, open the hatch and physically tug on the rope to make sure that it is attached to the airplane uh, structure. Now we're going to be checking the uh, next circuit panel, the circuit uh, breaker panel here, and this is called the P18 panel. And uh, lastly, the uh, crash axe. Make sure that it's stowed and secured. This uh, is the uh, safety 
inspection and the initial startup of the airplane uh, we can now actually go ahead and uh, take our seat uh, as we continue with the rest of the checks so we are now in our seat we have done the initial setup and we can now start with the uh, full setup um, first thing we're going to be doing is checking our oxygen mask uh, we're going to make sure that the oxygen is in the 100% position uh, I'm not familiar with this specific oxygen mask system but uh, you're going to be doing the test and as you do the test you're going to be looking at your crew oxygen indicator here so we're looking for a um, any uh, decrease of more than 100 psi or if it decreases rapidly or if it's really slow to increase back to normal uh, this could be an indication that the valve is not in the full position full open position uh, so make sure that the crew uh, oxygen mask uh, is working uh, before you actually depart the airplane uh, next up is your EFIS control panel now this is your EFIS control panel you're going to be setting this up uh, as you desire uh, I would suggest that you will have terrain on airports and also uh, traffic uh, as you can see now we have TKS failed and a map light because the uh, IRS position is not entered yet and TKS will uh, remain illuminated fail until you actually turn it on using your TKS panel uh, also you use uh, VRs or ADFs as required these are your RMIs and uh, once you're happy with the EFIS control panel the captain is going to be checking his uh, nose wheel steering switch and the first officer is actually going to be doing the ground proximity warning system by pressing the system test. The uh, nose wheel steering should be in the normal mode. Uh, normally the nose wheel is powered by system uh, A, but uh, if there is a problem with system A, you could actually move this to the alternate system and now system B will power the nose wheel steering. We can now start setting up our FMC. Uh, go to FMC and we're going to be starting at our ident page. Make sure that the airplane is the correct model, your engine ratings, your nav data uh, is the correct uh, uh, update and revision and that your software is up to date uh, in accordance with your fleet. Uh, now press position in it and start filling in the uh, pages now in my case we are in echo golf uh, sierra sierra actually this is a uh, blatant lie because we are not there at all we are actually in Gardamoen, which is echo november golf oscar put that in the uh, reference airport page now as you can see the set iris position have boxes whereas the reference airport have dashes. The dashes mean that the, the information there is optional. It is not required for the airplane to function properly. Uh, but we're going to nevertheless enter it. Is it Mike? My apologies. It is Economic Golf Mike. And um, as you can see now, you have the last position and the reference airport position. And you can see that they are reasonable. If not, the airplane would tell you that there is some kind of problem with your reference airport. For example, if I had actually put in Stansted, as I was trying to do in the beginning, uh, I will get a message here uh, explaining that there is something unreasonable with that airport. Uh, but back to Cardemo and we go. And we're going to be setting the IRS position. Now, you can see the position in it has one out of four pages. Using your previous and next page, you can cycle through the different pages. And uh, what I suggest you do is that go to the next page. So position reference number two. Use one of the GPS positions. These are by far the most accurate positions you have. Uh, they are more accurate than any kind of chart position. So select GPS left or right they should be the same uh, press previous go back to position in it one and then you just you place it in here in the uh, uh, 
uh, RS position and you can see now the airplane is aligned and the RS switches, sorry the RS uh, panel here will stop flashing uh, and the airplane is fully aligned now. As you can see now it suggests that you go to the root page so we'll do so and it will pre-populate the scratch pad with Echo November Golf Mic because it knows that you're gonna take off from the airport you're at so we'll pre-populate scratch pad and you can just simply place it in the region and now you can uh, fill in the destination you see the destination is mandatory you need to fill in the destination today we're gonna be going to Stansted in the uh, CO route, that's company route if your airline has a company route you can go ahead and fill that in and it will uh, pre-populate all the uh, the route pages for you. We're gonna fill in the uh, flight number here. So today we are flight sim number one. This data will then be transmitted down to ATC as well and they will be uh, able to see on their radar screens that you are transmitting flight sim number one. And runway in use. Uh, let's just have a look. One nine left. One nine left. Again, now this is a um, this is optional, but if you do put in the runway one nine left, the airplane will not only show you the runway initially, but if you now later go to depth arrival and select your departure, you can see that it will uh, highlight one nine left for you. So again, we filled in the origin, the destination, our flight number company route if you have and then the runway you're expecting to take off from after you've done this you can go ahead and go to route page number two and start filling in your route personally I prefer to enter the departure before so I will always go to depth arrival select my departure from Echo November Golf Mike as you can see again it will highlight one nine left you're going to select one nine left and it will remove all irrelevant departures today we're going to be flying a uh, OXA 1 Charlie departure select that and now it will suggest that you go to your root page which is uh, absolutely correct go ahead and press that that will take you back to the root page and you cannot fill in your uh, the rest of the route on the left side you will enter all airways and on the right side you will enter any kind of direct. Uh, today we don't have a full route, instead we're going to be flying direct to Barkway VR, Bravo Q Yankee and I cannot place it on the left because that is VIA and here you will only enter airways. So place it on the right side. Here I got two options, another threat uh, not only do I have the frequency, but I also have the coordinates to verify that I'm selecting the correct uh, navigate. In our case, it's going to be the top one, but you have to make sure uh, that you're selecting the correct one. There has been an accident uh, where everybody died due to them selecting the incorrect navigate. After that, you go to your depth arrival, and you can go ahead and select arrival now. And it's going to be Echo Sierra Sierra. It's going to be Alice yeah, Runway 2 2. And again, it will filter out any irrelevant stars. We're going to be flying a Abbott 1 Charlie and select your transition. I have checked the place and it's going to be an Abbott transition. And uh, you can now go back to root page. And as you can see, we have a discontinuity because uh, the route will actually take us to Barkway, but the arrival starts from Idacy. What I suggest you do now is to go to plan page. And we're going to be looking at our ND. Once you select the plan, and if you go to the legs page in your FMC, you will have the step feature. Selecting step will step through your routes. And we're looking for the discontinuity here. As you can see, it's going to go to Barkway, but from there, it's going to jump to Idacy. So we need to rectify this problem. Uh, I will do so by selecting Charlie India 2.2 is right here and I'll put that after Barkway so this is Barkway I'll select the next page and I'll select it up here and as you can see now 
we will fly to Barkway. And after Barkway, I'll make a left turn towards the ILS. Once I'm happy and satisfied with the whole route, I go back to the route page and I can now activate the route. So by activating it, you will not be able to execute the route. So we can go ahead and execute it. And you see that the cyan blue is now replaced with a uh, magenta color, uh, meaning and uh, signifying that the route is not active. Once we're happy with the root page, we're going to continue with the FMC, but now we're going to do the performance. So looking at the performance, as you can see again, if I go back to our init ref page, it will take me the performance in it because it suggests that I should go here. If you're ever unsure where to go, always press init ref. If it doesn't take you to the page you want, you will always have the index option at the bottom left. Wherever you are in the FMC, if you ever press uh, performance in it, sorry, if you ever press init ref, it will bring up the index position. From here on, you can select where you want to go. We want to go to the performance page, so we can go ahead and select performance. Start from the bottom, work your way up, and then go to the right and work your way down. That's the way I do it. It seems to be working for me. Select your cost index. Now, the cost index would be um, on your flight plan. Today we're going to be using a cost index of 30. The reserves will be on your flight plan. These are your final reserves, which are half an hour flight, plus your diversion fuel. Today is going to be 2.3 tons. The zero fuel weight you will also find on your flight plan. And the rail airplane, you cannot just click here and get it up, but you actually have to uh, check your load sheet. Select your cruise altitude, and uh, we're going to be cruising at uh, flight level 290 today. So we'll put 290 in there, and a cruise wind. Now the cruise wind is going to be your top of climb wind, and uh, the computer will now use that top of climb wind to calculate a econ climb speed for you. So if you have it available, go ahead and enter it right there and execute. You can also see that we have a transition altitude. Uh, this you will find on your plates in Europe uh, normally it's not 18,000 it will be something way lower um, for example I, uh, I think uh, guard more 7,000 I'm not sure but it will be something in that region as you can see now the FMC is suggesting that you go to the M1 limit page so go ahead and go to your M1 limit and you can fill in the temperature uh, in the real airplane, that temperature wouldn't be uh, pre-populated. You would actually have to check the ATIS, get the current uh, temperature, and fill it in there. And um, now we're going to be doing our performance. And in real life, doing the performance involves uh, doing some calculations. Normally, we'll use graph and tables, and we'll go in with the actual runway conditions. And today's uh, temperature, wind, pressure, and calculate the D rate and assume and then also the airspeeds um, nowadays uh, we actually use a iPad to do the same calculations we can with confidence select 22k and go to the takeoff page again the airplane is uh, FMC is suggesting which page to go to next select your takeoff flap uh, flap 5 is used 99% uh, of the times so go ahead and select flap 5 I get an error message here saying the V-speeds are unavailable. Uh, it's just because the airplane is filled up with fuel. So if you're using PMDG, you can go to FS Actions, Fuel, and then just lower the fuel. We'll select the airspeeds. You see we have a message here saying unable to 30 by Golf Mike 604. Uh, we have to look at this before we actually continue uh, with, their, uh, with the setup. So we'll have a look at this. And you can see this says at 2.30. Uh, now the airplane will be unable to accelerate to 2.30 by that waypoint. And uh, looking at the plate, the plate says 2.30 or below on the airspeed. So put 2.30 below. If you, uh, anything without a kind of slash will always default to the right side. Because we want this speed to be on the left side, we need to enter that slash. And now we can put it up here. And we have now changed it to 2.30 or below on the airspeed. 
and the message has not disappeared. Okay, I don't know which page to go to. I want to go to the takeoff page again. So if I'm unsure how to get there, press in drift. And you can see drift will take me either to index, and here I can select takeoff, or if I press in drift, it will just uh, suggest go to M1 limit. I'll go to M1 limit. We're, we're happy with this page. It will now suggest takeoff page, and I'm back at the takeoff page. As you can see now, we have 141, 143, and 150 on our speeds. So I will also place 150 in our MCP. The 150 is our um, uh, V2 speed. This is the airspeed we're going to be flying if we have an engine failure. Now, the airplane is smart in the way that it knows when the engine failed. So if the engine fails before V2, the flight directors will command a acceleration up to V2 and then it will command you to fly V2. If the engine fails after V2, until V2 plus 20, it will just command the current airspeed. And if the engine fails after V2 plus 20, it will command V2 plus 20. So your V2 speed is extremely important uh, when it comes to engine failures. Uh, so the FMC is now fully set up. We are happy with uh, all the pages and we're just going to leave it in the takeoff page. Once we've done that, we can go ahead and set up our overhead panel. The overhead panel will be uh, set up from up to down and from left to right. So the first thing we'll be checking is our flight controls. All these switches should be uh, guarded. None of the lights should be on at the moment except the yaw damper. Uh, which we're going to go ahead and turn on now. The yaw damper will not engage until the RSMO selectors on, are in the nav position. They will, it will engage uh, before they are aligned though. Next up is going to be your navigation panel. Your VHF, your IRS and FMC should all be in normal positions. Next up is the display. This should be in normal and auto. Uh, normally the airplane would be left in this uh, state as well. Uh, that does not mean that you should not check it. You should check it uh, during every flight. Next up comes the uh, fuel system. Uh, as you can see, the engine valve and the spar valves are closed um, for both engines. That's because the start lever is in the cutoff position. Uh, that is uh, normal. Uh, we're going to be checking the crossfeed valve. We're going to be rotating the valve to open it. As you note, the uh, the the light position here is bright and then after after it's been bright it will actually turn dim now bright means that it's not in the commanded position so if I again I will demonstrate I will close it we know the valve is open because the light is dim but when I close it it will move from the closed position sorry excuse me from the open position to the closed position and during that transition time it is not in the commanded position and thus the light will be illuminated bright. It's bright because it's moving and once it's in the uh, closed position the light will go out. Again it will open, it's bright, the valve is moving to the full open position and once the valve is in the commanded position of open the light will go dim. So once we're happy with the uh, operation of the center, uh, sorry the crossfeed valve, we're going to go ahead and turn on the fuel pumps we're going to be using. Today we have no fuel in the center tank, so we're going to leave the center tank pumps off and we'll be only using the main pumps here. Uh, now we're going to be going to our electrical systems and uh, we're going to make sure the cabin, utility, IFE, pass seat switches are in the on position and that the uh, standby power is in the guard position and the IDGs uh, are also guarded. Next up is going to be our um, fasten belt because we're going to leave this position, uh, th this or this panel as it is. We're using ground power still. Uh, if I wanted to, do, I could switch over to APU, but I'm just going to leave it on the ground source for the moment. So next up is the fasten belts. We can go ahead and turn that on once the fueling is uh, complete. And after that, we're going to be moving up again, and we're going to be going to our window heat. So our window heat. Our window heat switches should be moved on and they should also be on approximately 10 minutes before departure time to allow sufficient time for the window heat, uh, sorry, the window heat to uh, 
actually heat up the windows. The probe heat should be in the off position uh, normally, unless it is uh, winter operations. In that case, you would actually turn them on uh, right now, but for now, we can leave them in the off position. Make sure that the engine NTIs and the wing NTIs is in the off position and that the uh, hydraulic pumps are still on and the lights, the e -like lights are extinguished and the engine lights are on because the engines are not on, obviously. Uh, next up comes the precession panel and we're going to be checking that our diff pressure, which is the outer scale, is reading zero and that the cabin altitude is reading the airfield elevation. The cabin climb rate should be uh, zero. And now we're gonna be looking at our air conditioning panel up here. We're gonna be starting off with uh, having a look at temperatures. So make sure that the um, cabin temperatures are okay. These two switches are for the cabin temperature, whereas these are the duct supply temperatures. And towards the right, you will see the pack temperatures. Turn on the trim air if it's not on already and uh, make sure that the RAM doors are open, should always be open on, uh, on the ground. The recirculation fans should be in the auto position and position the switch, uh, sorry, your packs as desired. Uh, right now I want the pack switches to be in the auto position. I will leave the isolation valve in the open position. I will verify that the engine bleeds are on. Uh, this is really important because the engines will later provide bleed air pressurize the airplane. I can go ahead and turn on the APU bleeder. As my APU is now on, APU bleed will be used to power the left pack. It will go through the isolation valve and also power up the right pack. Now the airplane is being provided with air conditioning and the passengers will be very happy. Set up your cruise altitude. Today we said we're gonna be cruising at 290 and your uh, airfield uh, elevation as well. Make sure that the precession mode selector is in the auto position. Again, all these things are extremely important. Uh, we all know what happened to the Helios, uh, which uh, crashed um, partly due to the fact that this switch was in the manual position. This is uh, the end of the uh, overhead panel, uh, but before we move down, you're just going to make sure that the lights are the way you want them. You're going to make sure that the steady light is on because uh, that light should always be on uh, when the airplane has uh, AC power provided to it. And uh, once you're happy with the light positions, you can go ahead and move down and you can arm your auto brake by moving the switch to RTO. That stands for rejected takeoff and that will automatically apply full brakes if you reject the takeoff at high speed. Um, we're gonna be checking our engine instruments. Uh, we'll make sure that uh, no engine indication is playing some, is displaying some um, problem or any exceedances uh, and that you have enough engine oil to meet dispatch requirements uh, in our case, it's uh, 12 quarters. Uh, now this uh, configuration shows percentage instead. We're gonna reset the fuel flow. And uh, again, it's important to do this as um, you want the fuel flow to be reset before you actually start your flight. I'm gonna move down, make sure that the speed brake is in the down detent position, that the reversers are down and locked and that the start levers are in the cutoff position. We're gonna go ahead and set the parking brake at this stage and make sure that the stabilizer, the step trim cutoff switches are in the normal position and that they will be guarded to the normal position. Uh, so make sure that they are guarded. And uh, you can now do the fire test again uh, if you do not have AC power when you did it the first time. But because we had, we have uh, already done the fire test Instead, we can go ahead and do the uh, cargo fire test. Um, again, if you didn't do all these uh, before, which you already did, so we can go ahead and discard 
not only the fire test but also the cargo fire test as well after this we're gonna move down and verify that our rudder and aileron trim both are not only functioning but they're free and zero zero meaning that they're showing zero on the trim and zero on the aileron and uh, that's it folks the airplane is now fully set up to start the uh, engines as you can see there's quite a lot of steps which uh, have to be done in a precise order and, uh, it requires again airmanship and discipline hope you enjoyed this video if you did like it go ahead and leave a like please do subscribe and as always follow me on uh, twitch uh, where you can watch me live uh, i also have an instagram where you can watch some cool pictures from the real airplane this is pilot h until the next one see you later